As we hear our scripture lesson today from 1 John, the fourth chapter, I invite you to turn your hearts and your minds attentively to hear these words. Dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's Son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us and God's love is made perfect in us. This is how we know we remain in God and God remains in us because God has given us a measure of God's spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If any of us confesses that Jesus is God's Son, God remains in us and we remain in God. We have known and have believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who remain in love remain in God and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us so that we can have confidence on the judgment day because we are exactly the same as God is in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect and loved. We love because God first loved us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, we have just finished a sermon series looking at the roots of United Methodism. And I start a new sermon series today called Questions We Ask God. I'm helping us to focus a lot on what we believe these days, because I think it's important to understand what we believe, because everybody believes something. No matter what you believe, if you think about it, it matters what your beliefs are. Your beliefs influence your actions and your decisions in life. It matters a lot what we say we believe. Just think for a minute about Adolf Hitler and what he believed. He was raised Catholic, but as a young man, he converted to a Protestant church in Germany that did not believe the Hebrew origins of the Bible. So they were anti-Semitic. As part of the emblem in the center of the cross in that church was a swastika. Very interesting, right? And so later he used that as the symbol of the Nazi party. I would say it matters what we believe. For he launched the Holocaust. One of the worst, if not the worst, atrocity in all of human history. Or think for a minute about Jim Jones. Any of y'all remember that name, Jim Jones? Jim Jones was actually a Methodist pastor 
in Indianapolis for a time. But he left the Methodist church because the church that he attended did not welcome black people. So he had some good beliefs about inclusiveness. But when he left the Methodist church, he started his own church, the People's Temple. And they believed some very unusual things. He moved the headquarters of his church to San Francisco and then eventually to South America. For those of you who remember, in 1978, almost a thousand people followed his direction and they drank Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. They committed suicide because of what they believed. It matters a lot, my friends, what we believe and what we say we believe in. Now, United Methodists are sometimes described by people outside our denomination as a denomination where you can believe anything you want to believe. Our open hearts, open minds, open doors leads people to think anything goes. And there's a part of me that says, you know, that sounds like freedom. Think and let think. But is it really true that in this denomination you can believe anything you want to believe? It's not. We have articles, a religion that outline for us the foundation of our beliefs. So say, for instance, just as we're receiving new members into the congregation this afternoon, just say, for instance, someone wanted to join this church, and they said to me that they believed in a racist ideology, that they believed that there are some groups of people who are superior to other groups of people. Well, we'd have to challenge them on that, wouldn't we? We'd have to say, no, that is not what we believe here. That is not consistent with our beliefs in this church. If someone comes in and they say, well, my belief is that the purpose in life is just for me to be happy. Anything goes. Life is to make me happy. And therefore, the point of the church is to cater to my needs and to make me comfortable. Well, I'd have to challenge them on that too. Because sometimes we are called to afflict the comfortable just as we are to comfort the afflicted. We follow and gather together at the foot of a cross, don't we? A cross where Christ sacrificed himself and called us to take up our own cross and follow. Or as John said in the text we read today, we are to love one another even when it means sacrifice on our part. It's not all about me, myself and I, and what makes me happy in this life. So my friends, I think it's really important that we think about our beliefs and we challenge our beliefs and we know why we believe what we believe. Every week in this worship service, we recite a creed, a different creed that proclaims what we believe. And we are called to live out those beliefs in our everyday life. I want to challenge each one of us throughout this Lenten season to think deeply about what it is that we believe. Because there are so many people outside the walls of the church who presume they know what we believe. And we need to be able to stand firmly on what it is that we believe. Because here's what I know. If we don't question and challenge what we believe, there are competing forces out there that will feed into us and tell us what we're supposed to believe. 
And it's too easy for us to let those competing voices dictate what we believe. That's exactly why all of those people followed Jim Jones and Adolf Hitler. A lack of questioning what they believed. And here's a statement that I'd like for us to hold on to that a friend of mine shared with me. My friend said, I will either let the world influence what I believe or I will let what I believe influence the world. I will either let the world influence what I believe or I will let what I believe influence the world. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We do that when we stand firmly in what we believe. So over the next several weeks, I want to focus on some of the questions that I believe people have been asking about faith for a millennia. And today's question is, who is God? What is God like? When we say, I believe in God, what does that mean? Now, our Muslim friends are likely to answer that God is one. And we would agree with that. We believe that God is one made known to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Jewish friends might say God is holy. And we would agree with that, that God is holy. Our articles of religion and our creeds give to us many definitions of what we believe about God. For religion is always humanity's attempt to describe and to know and to understand God. But my friends, God is much bigger than any description that any of us can come up with. And there is no way that I can stand here and in a brief sermon share with you a complete answer to who God is. But I want to challenge you to understand who God is for you and to grow in that understanding. Harry Emerson Fosdick, the great preacher in his book, wrote about these words. He said, we cannot possibly jump outside of our human experience and find any terms with which to describe God except such terms as our day-to-day -day living provides. All of our thinking about God has to be done in pictures and in symbols and in images drawn from our human experience, from things that we know each day. And so as United Methodist, we draw our understanding about who God is in four ways. Known as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, Scripture, the Holy Scripture that helps us understand who God is, tradition, the creeds of the church, the hymns of the church, what others who have walked this path of faith have said and discovered and experienced about God. Reason, as I talked about last week, thinking about what we understand about God and what we read in the scriptures about God and experience, our own experience of God. The passage of Scripture that I read for us today from 1 John says very succinctly in three words how we can describe God. God is love. And I thought about that. I thought about how John could so succinctly just say simply, God is love. When you, we use so many more words to describe our understanding of God. And it occurred to me that it's because what God desires more than anything else is a relationship 
with each one of us. And we get to know who God is most assuredly when we have a relationship with God. More than anything else, God desires for us to have a personal relationship. That's why God came in human form as Jesus Christ to touch us with love. But God has always wanted this personal relationship. Think back with me in the Old Testament. Some of you know very well the Old Testament book of Exodus and the story of Moses. Moses is walking along and he sees a burning bush and he hears God's voice call out to him for him to go to the most powerful man in the land of Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let the Hebrew children who are slaves go free. And Moses comes up with excuse after excuse after excuse why he can't go. And God keeps saying, but I'm going with you, but I'm going with you. And Moses says, well, you know, this is a mighty big task that you're asking me to do, God. So tell me your name. Tell me your name. And that sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? But in that culture, knowing someone's name meant that you took something of that person's power with you. In a way, it's the same way today, isn't it? If I said I stand before you as a representative of the bishop, you'd say, oh, the bishop's speaking. So Moses wanted to know God's name, and God simply says, I am. My name is I am. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about the meaning of names before. But that got me to thinking, what does the name I am mean? Have you ever thought about the meaning of your name? Some of you have. I used to like to tell people that I loved my name, Rebecca, because in the Bible, Rebecca is described as beautiful. But then I looked up the meaning of the name, Rebecca. And the meaning of the name Rebecca is to join, to tie, or to snare. And I thought, what kind of name do I have? My husband's name is Richard, and his name means brave ruler. Why couldn't I get a name like that? Catherine's name means pure. Why couldn't I get a name like that? Austin's name means location on a hillside. (laughs) Well, names. God says, my name is I am. And scholars differ on really trying to understand exactly what that name means. Some me, some believe it means I will be who I will be. And others look at the context and say, God's been telling Moses, I am with you. I will go with you. And Moses wants to know God's name because Moses is scared to do what God has called him to do. And so God says, my name is I am. That means I am here with you. I am here with you. I will give you power to do what you need to do. I will be with you. And in the New Testament, Jesus takes on that name. And Jesus uses lots of different metaphors at the end. I am the bread of life that will sustain you. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Abide in me. The name helps us understand that God will always be with us. That God wants a deep relationship with each and every one of us. A relationship that is built on love. United Methodist preacher J. Howard Olds tells a story that he says he will never forget as he tried to understand about this deep love of God 
He said he was going with a mother to visit her teenage son in a county jail, and he had understood that this son had done some horrible things in his life. He'd made mistakes. And then his biggest mistake was he ran away from the police as a fugitive for years. But he finally was caught and he landed in jail. And one night, the mother asked her pastor to go with him to visit her son in prison. He said they walked that dark, dingy hallway in the county jail. And as they entered the place where his cell was, he said he watched in silence as that heartbroken mother walked slowly up to the bars of that cell and she reached in to touch the face of her son and to hold it up so she could look him square in the eyes. And she said to him, Son, no matter what you've done, I will always love you. I will always want the best for you. I will always be here for you. Howard Old said, as he listened to that mother, he thought, God loves us like that. An unconditional, eternal love. A love that is always there for us, reaching out to us and beckoning us to reach out to others in love. The Reverend Thomas Bandy tells about a meeting time when his wife, also a pastor, was in attendance. The meeting was sponsored by a group in their denomination, and to begin the meeting, kind of the customary question, it was a sharing time. And so he asked, how did you experience God this week? And several people in the room said they experienced God in nature, in a cottage, in the woods, in a sunset. Several other people said that they had experienced God in the laughter of their children and in the people who were around them. And as the participants listened to one another, they all, yeah, God's in the midst of each one of us like that, God's in nature. We get to know God as we watch a sunset and as we climb the mountains and as we stare out at the ocean, as we listen to children play. And other people said, well, I met God and experienced God in music this week, which I'm sure all of us did with that beautiful music presented to us today. But then one woman a newcomer in the group said this. She said, I'm 35 years old. And one morning this week, I awakened with an incredible compulsion to go and see my ex-husband. Now, normally I'm not a very spontaneous person, she said. In fact, I don't really like my ex-husband. We haven't spoken in over a year. But I was filled with such a compulsion to see him that I literally could not resist it. So I gathered up our children, I dressed hurriedly, and I drove over to his house. And there we found him, collapsed on the floor, having experienced a massive heart attack. We called 911. And I'm here to tell you, he survived. The listeners were stunned. Some stirred uncomfortably in their chairs, and then finally one person said, Holy cow! Yeah. Holy cow. Now, I don't know how you explain that, but here's how she explained it. She felt God reaching out to her and nudging her because God wants a personal relationship with each one of us. God loved her and God loved that ex-husband that she couldn't stand. And God wanted her to reach out in love 
to him. My dear friends, God loves us with an everlasting, deep, and abiding love. So as we go through this sermon series and we look at questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? I want to encourage you to hold on to that belief that God is love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.